Welcome to the course this morning, um, using your text in video, but better. And I am thrilled to say I'm, enjoy I'm joined by two brilliant, wonderful colleagues from the digital development team. Uh, let's start with Nikita. Would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us who you are, where you are, what you do. Hello, I'm Nikita. I'm based in New Delhi. Um, I work with the digital development video team and uh, just basically help languages um, across world service make better videos and just come up with like new ways of telling stories in video. Excellent. Really lovely to have you here this morning, Nikita. Lovely. Thank um, you. Board, welcome. Hello. Good to be back. Um, it's been a few months now, I think. Um, so yeah, I'm with, so with all the restructuring and, and everything uh, going on, the team is actually now called Formats Video Team. Um, and I'm one of the uh, SJs in there, um, based in London. And um, if you've come across me before, it's probably because I've been sending emails and shouting about fonts and stitch and mm -hmm. templates and stuff like that. I, I look after a lot of the time from a technical point of view, uh, video production. Um, but I also do enjoy uh, getting into the editorial side. So we've got two brilliant guests this morning um, who are going to share their considerable knowledge with us. Um, just some rules for today. Um, please keep your sound and video off, if possible, just so the bandwidth survives. Um, please, please do ask questions, but could you ask them in the chat and we will answer them at relevant times. There's also going to be time for a Q&A at the end as well. And it, it also, if you want to demonstrate something uh, that you've worked out you can do with the with the templates that's a great opportunity to do it at the end as well um, and just a reminder as well that I am recording this session it's going to be going onto the YouTube channel at the end brilliant um what this is what's coming up today we're going to ask this really important question how can I use text better in my videos a big part of that is how you can use text less because great videos, in our opinion, aren't too text heavy. Great video is about pictures, it's about sound, and we're going to explore ways to, uh, to use text less. Um, Board is going to do a little demonstration of how to use the text templates better, different things, how, which ones you use, when and where. It'll also show you a few little things you might not know about them. I am going to go through a little session on subtitling or captioning uh, properly. And at the end, there's going to be plenty of time, as I said, for a Q&A. Excellent. Um, I'm going to hand over to Nikita, um, who's going to talk you through different ways of using text less, or better still, how to use your reporter or voiceover, but in a digital way. Nikita, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, Dan. So, Thank okay, let's coming. just jump straight in. I think one of the key things that we all want you to remember throughout this session is that when people are watching your video, they want to watch something. They're not there to read something, <laughs> like not, not read a lot, really. Uh, so a really important bit here is to use text less. We'll talk about that throughout the course. And I think um, eventually even Dan's going to talk more about, you know, how do you ask the right questions of people uh, to use text less. But one of the key things that I'm going to start with is whether, like, how can you use a presenter and how can you probably use voiceover instead of text in your video sometimes uh, to, again, reduce the amount of text that you're using. Um, so these are the three principles that, Again, just, just remember that every time you're making a digital video, and I think video these days is entirely digital. <laughs> so we shouldn't even like say that word a lot anymore. But um, so conversational, authentic, and dynamic. Uh, so when I talk about voiceover, and when I talk about using a presenter, just reminding everyone, not every story warrants itself to a presenter or a voiceover. So do not take that route for quick and dirty videos. Do not use that when you have to like immediately push something out there into ours, because if you try doing that in that amount of time, it usually ends up not working out really well because you're not spending as much time planning and understanding whether your script is conversational and like whether your shots are dynamic and all of those things. 
So I think before we go deeper into this, let's watch uh, a couple of examples. Um, and I'm sure you'll understand what I've been saying. There's a Tesla, electric of course, behind it an electric Nissan, uh, a few cars back another Tesla, behind that an electric Kia. They're everywhere in Oslo. How long have you had an electric car? Since September last year. And what was your car before? A BMW 3 Series, a, a petrol. petrol, yeah. So I think it's, again, for me, it's really important to really say that the video starts with a bit of text. Um, and for me, that probably slows it down a bit. But also, when you move forward, you, you do have a presenter. The presenter is trying uh, to be conversational. And you know he's showing you this car and that car. And um, but he's in a suit. So we'll talk about that as well. But, uh, but then uh, I, think, I think that's it. I, just, I don't want to talk a lot about it, because I want you to watch the second one and then just form your own opinions. Up until today, I had seen a total of about five Teslas in my entire life. And three of those five were behind glass cases in luxury malls. I've been in Oslo for like a couple of hours and I've seen like 50 Teslas. There's one right there. They're beautiful, they're sleek, they are efficient, they're fast, and they're $70,000. Here comes another one up the road. Oh yeah. 100% electricity, no gas, and it can go from like zero to 100 kilometers in like five seconds. I have no idea, I'm not a car person, so I don't know if that's right. But. Here in Norway in 2014, Tesla actually broke a record for number of cars sold in a month for a single model of any kind of car, not just electric cars. And you look around for a few minutes and you realize it's not just Teslas, there are electric cars everywhere. Like I see electric cars in the United States, but nothing like this. Oh, there's a Tesla. There's a Tesla. There it goes. I think you're getting what I'm saying here. In the second video, the presenter, very popular, Johnny Harris, he has a certain style to himself. What he's wearing is the kind of clothes we wear when we're going out. Uh, he's talking to you. He's not talking at you. So I think these are some really important things to remember when you're using a presenter or even when you're using voiceover in your piece. So make it sound like you're talking to a friend. Um, use a lot of active language. It was great to see him like literally pointing out and being like, oh, hey, it's there or whatever. And then you see these cars. You see a lot of great visuals throughout the piece as well. Another thing is that he sounds quite authentic. He's not doing a regular piece to camera. He's like moving around, he's talking to you. So of course, like he's quite dynamic as well. So again, I think when I talk about authenticity, just trying, like, I want to remind everyone that even if you're using a presenter, just don't use mics, like those big TV mics that kind of, I, I feel like all of that TV language that we use a lot of times acts as a barrier between the story and the viewer. And we don't want to act as a barrier, we want to act as a bridge. And so use your presenters and your voiceover to act as a bridge between you know, the story and the viewer. And the last one is um, movement. So film on the go as the presenter is walking around, moving around, driving a car, finding clues, whatever they're doing, think about locations, just keep it moving because it's like, again, it's the worst thing to have something that's super static in a video. Uh, I won't go in a lot of detail about this. We do a separate course on our team sometimes and we sort of train people on using presenters better and we train presenters as well. Um, so we can help you with that in the future if anyone needs help. But bringing it back to our current conversation, just, yeah, I guess people are here to watch your video, not to read your video. And that's, can, the, yeah. that's the important point. The, the, the first video started really quite slowly with those bits of text. We, you know, our templates do work, but they can be quite slow and they can slow things down. And as Nikita says, they almost provided like a barrier between the audience and the human part of the story. And the human part of the story in this case was the presenter or was the people on the Vox Pops. There was just a barrier. The text was slowing everything down. So try and think of ways 
around using text. Um, Nikki, so what do you want to talk about next? So, uh, yes, I mean, just wanted to remind you all of this. Every time you're doing a video, just remember these three words. And uh, even if you don't think about anything else, if you just try and think about these three words, you're, it'll hopefully just be better than whatever we're trying to do right now, especially when it comes to text versus presenter and voiceovers. Uh, we can now go to the next one. Uh, this is a BBC video where, again, um, we've used a presenter and it kind of fulfills all of the things we're talking about. It's also a serious topic. So like Tesla wasn't in the same way, a very serious, grim topic, but this one is. Uh, and it's still conversational. It's still authentic and dynamic. So just um, showing you a bit of this. The visuals you are seeing are from the northern Indian city of Allahabad. Locals there say that these are the graves of people who died of COVID in April. When crematoriums ran out of space, people just buried their dead by the river. Now experts say that visuals like these suggests that the actual number of COVID deaths in many parts of India is likely to be much higher than what the official data says. The second wave has ravaged cities and is now spreading to villages where healthcare facilities are often poor and COVID deaths are not properly documented. We are driving to some villages in Uttar Pradesh state to see how COVID has devastated rural India and how hundreds of deaths in those areas went unreported. But first, let's talk about Allahabad. I show this video quite a lot in a number of my courses. I think it's a really, really good example. What do you like it particularly about, about this, Nikita? Well, I think uh, it is, again, like one of those stories where you'd normally think that it's really hard to be conversational. And, and I agree that, you know, you can't just be like, hey, look at this or whatever. It's a very serious and sad story. Uh, but again, the, the way the reporter talks to you, um, it, it sounds like a friend is telling you about what's happening in this area. You see the reporter going around, he's driving, he, you, you see him like in different locations and you don't see him a lot. Um, so I think that's very important. No mics used here, which is great. Uh, he's not wearing a suit. Uh, so that is also something that I feel like uh, helps reduce that barrier entirely. And um, towards the end, again, like if we play that little bit where he goes into a room, Dan. Okay. When we spoke to people in those two villages, they pointed out that the primary healthcare center wasn't working during the peak of Corona in April and May. Now, each village has a primary healthcare center. There should be a doctor. There should be a nurse. Let's come here, let me show you the condition of this primary health care center near uh, Kushalia. There is some construction work going on. It's shut. Let's come inside. Even now, there seems to be no facility to quarantine or even treat patients who are not very severe. Now, many villagers pointed out that even if primary health care centers like these had some oxygen beds, some of those lives could have been saved. All right. So yeah, just like things like just come inside, just see here, Th those that kind of phrasing. So a lot of active phrasing that's being used. Um, so I guess all of that works better than passive phrasing. And uh, then just like being in one place and not moving a lot or using like TV hands. Um, so I guess that's what I just wanted people to watch, especially for uh, serious and like um, really intense stories like this one. Um, I think the point we're making here is that this isn't digital video doesn't have to be text on screen. There, there, there was, you know, definitely for a number of years, people thought digital video is no reporter, it's text on screen. What these videos prove, I think, is you can absolutely have a reporter. They've just got to get the tone right. They've got to be. They've got to be very active, as, as Nikita's saying. You know, Vikas there is talking about, you know, come with me. And it's very involving. It's very, there's a huge connection with the audience. So 
absolutely you can have voiceover you can do, you can have reporter led pieces in digital you've just got to get the tone right i think yeah and i to get the tone right you just need to plan better as well when i like when you're writing your script so even the johnny harris video obviously he just didn't go there and you know he's not just doing it right off the bat or just saying whatever he feels like saying he's definitely worked on the script he's definitely thought about what sounds like him uh, so that that is again authenticity right like because a lot of times when we give a script to the reporter and it doesn't sound like the reporter then it, it's it again like loses the authenticity right there so i guess just just important to make it all natural i think as well i mean so many of us are working for you know social platforms for tv as well and there is this huge pressure on reporters shoot edits vjs to kind of be making content for both you know can or can you do a tv package and can you do a digital package i mean there's no reason at all that a video like this couldn't work on both platforms it absolutely would work on television it actually make tv programs a lot better if the reports were like this but it's also working brilliantly for digital as well because of his tone because of the way he's taking you on the journey and and i know we're all under this enormous pressure we've, we're told to make we're told to make almost two sets of content i don't necessarily think we have to do that this is a really good example of how you make content that works for both all right so now let's talk a little bit about using your text better um, and for that, we'll again start with a couple of examples. If we can play the next one, yes. I've seen also that the Hindi version, which is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful piece of filmmaking. The, the video journalist has done a wonderful job in terms of the shots, the characters he's got. What, what did you think about this particular edit, though, this version of it, Nikita? Why, why are we talking about this? I think the first thing to remember here is that, OK, we are at 48 seconds in this video. And bef everything before this is just text. So uh, that is just something to be really wary of, that your video starts with text. And for 48 seconds, you just get slates of text one after the other. And it's a beautiful video, yes. But I think that just takes away that human connection again. Um, and while I was, again, looking at a lot of these examples, I wanted to look at an example of probably a very similar story, but done by someone else, slightly more in a way that we're talking about. So um, let's watch this other video. যখন ঘরের ভিতরে জলটা ঢুকছে যেন সমস্যা একটা শব্দ হচ্ছে আর দেখটা আমাকে ধরে কান্না কাটি করছে মানে ও যখন আমাকে আগড়ে ধরে আমি ওকে আগড়ে ধরে নিয়ে ওই বাড়ি ছেড়ে মানে উপরে বাঁধের উপরে উঠি তখন ঝুপ ঝুপ করে দেখতে দেখতে চাঁদের দেওয়াল পড়ে গিয়ে ঘরটা এমনিতেই বসে গেল ইয়া সো আই গ্যাস অ্যাগেন সামথিং ওয়ে আই ডোন্ট ওয়ান্ট টু সে আ লট আই জাস্ট ওয়ান্ট ইউ অল টু মেক ইউর ওন ওপিনিয়ন অ্যাবাউট দিস বাট দের আর টু ভিডিওস ভেরি সিমিলার টপিকস ওয়ান হ্যাজ আ লট অফ টেক্সট দিস ওয়ান ইভেন্টুয়ালি লাইক ওয়েন ইউ ওয়াচ দিস ভিডিও ইট ইজ ভয়েস ওভার লেড 
but also you hear human voices right at the beginning and you and I think some of it is also it all just comes down to better planning maybe like maybe the reporter here had more time and they they asked a lot more questions because when you ask more questions of your contributors and if you're like already set in your like you, you want these answers and I think Dan's going to talk about that eventually but uh, just to kind of remind you all that that is also a really important way of reducing text right like when when people can say that themselves uh, and you don't have to use text to say that I just want to add one thing as well when I was at BBC Africa running the digital video team that we really tried to have a rule where you wouldn't start a video with a piece of text. You'd always try and start with a strong quote, either from the, you know, from the main contributor, the, the main character in your film, or from the, or from, or from the reporter. I just wanted to get that human connection right from the beginning. Think about where people are watching. They're watching on their phones, and our phones are all about human connection. We we want stuff that we can immediately. Yeah connect with and text the, the, the beautiful film before the BBC version of, of the Sunderburn story starts as, as Nikita said with 48 seconds before you actually meet your main character I think it'd be so much stronger to go straight to go straight in at the beginning as as this film did here and we, we meet the character where straight away the actual shot itself is incredible because we always say you know we want to feel like we're in somebody else's shoes I mean, this shot is putting you right there. It's making you feel that, you know, you are, you, you've got total empathy and understanding. So always look for the human connection first. I think it's always worth starting a video with that strong human clip. I also feel like because a lot of us um, come from that TV understanding of things, I see that a lot of videos start with beautiful wide shots mm -hmm. and that goes on for a while before we see a person. And so exactly what you said there, Dan, makes a lot of sense that we need to go into the person first. Uh, just some quick tips now. So all of uh, what we've talked about up until now has been more about videos where you get a little more time and you get, you, you're you able to plan a little better. But what do we do when you have to do breaking news videos or like just find a way to uh, do quick turnaround videos. Uh, so for that, again, let's start with an example. I get it, this entire video is stitched using agency footage, right? And we do that a lot. It's how long is it? Like a minute? It's just over a 10, minute, yeah. 15, yeah, just over a minute. But throughout this video, you're seeing lots of visuals of this flood, but you're also reading a lot of text. And honestly, for me, I don't know how it works for everyone else, but for me, I think when I'm reading the text, I forget about what's going on in the background or like it's really difficult for me to take both things at once um especially when there's too much text so i think for for these sorts of videos again your user like your audiences are really interested in seeing what's happening and not in reading what's happening so here they've used i think five sentence plates so again like yeah just just let's see this is one of the screenshots that uh, Dan took from a comment on that video. So this is the top comment on the video uh, at the moment on YouTube. I love how they could have had somebody explain it in less than 30 seconds, but they choose to put text up to make it longer so that you have to wait and reach the end. Realistically, as Nikita says, you know, if, if there's too much to read, you, the, you're, you're not getting into it. You're, you're just reading, 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 and you're not actually kind of 
you know, taking in the pictures. And it's the pictures on a story like that that are really, really interesting. You've got another example of a similar story yes. to show us, haven't you, Nikita? Uh, yeah. So now this is another flood story. Um, so watch this. similar length of video a fraction of the text what, what's the impact of that then the case do you think i think uh they they do a lot of things better in this one i'm sure the when when you think about the time it must have taken to edit this versus the time it must have taken to edit the bbc one probably was the same um but but here they just use two sentences of text uh throughout this one minute video and uh, in the first one, there are five sentences of text throughout the video. There's just no breathing space. So with this one, I think when I watched it, I, I read the first bit. Then I got a lot of time to really see what was happening. Then I read the second bit. And then I got a lot of time again to really see what was happening. And I, I just think that it helped me understand the story better um, because I wasn't constantly reading. Um, Gagan sent in a message. Uh, thanks very much, Gagan. Um, referring to the BBC version, he said there is hardly any natural sound on this video. Uh, it would have helped the piece breathe a little if they'd had some natural sound. He also said the text lines are very also very long, which is exactly right. Exactly. All of those and things I, give the yeah. audience a chance to absorb what's happening. And that's what the New York Times video does really, really nicely. It uses the natural sound um, and it allows you to, to kind of take in what's happening. Yeah. Um, um, Moshi adds, uh, also on the China floods, the visuals are quite repetitive. Germany floods offer visuals of the devastation. It is much more at ground level, the shots as well. It's also and you see a lot of people as well, I think, in the, the New York Times one, you're actually seeing a lot of action, which obviously, you know, like, I don't know what footage was available while we were editing the China video versus uh, because I think the New York Times has a, a story full subscription, which is great. <laughs> but uh, but I feel like still even using a bit of time on finding the right visuals out of your agency footage goes a long way. Sometimes we just immediately find whatever we can find and stitch it up and put it out there. Um, yeah, it's all about like making impact. Um, also as well, I think it's, it's worth not ruining your best shots with bits of text right so this totally. is probably the most powerful shot of this video you've got a house yeah. literally collapsing in, in front of your eyes and they haven't covered it with text at all um they the shots they choose for their text and there aren't very many are the shots where there's not quite so much happening all right so if, when you're looking at your rushes or if, if you're lucky enough to be going out filming something i always film a couple of kind of wide shots just yeah. to put text on if, if i'm knowing going to be using text i, I don't I don't cover my big yeah. close ups or my really interesting shots with text. Yeah, you're right. One of my friends, uh, he said that to me once, you know, years ago that, yeah, like use text on your boring shots. And, and that's it. So I was, yeah, I always remember that whenever I have to use text. <laughs> I've seen some really clever video journalists as well, deliberately shoot shots yeah. to put text on. So, you know, for instance, I, I'm going to give an example that I did once just because it's come to, come to my mind. I, I I filmed the side of a train. I was doing a piece about trains. Bored or laugh because I had a reputation for just, just doing pieces trains. about trains. But I, I filmed the side of a train and I put my text slate on. And when the train moved off, I moved the text off with it. So I was, I was thinking all the time about what shots can I put, put text on. Another time I put a train pulling off and as the train pulled off, it revealed a piece of text underneath. So you can shoot shots specifically to put bits of text on, which just makes it a bit more interesting. I think this is pretty much the last 
bit that I want to focus on. The first thing is use less, less text because visuals should always come first. And you saw that in all of the examples that we're talking about, especially just think, thinking back to the floods example. So it's not just about writing concisely. It is important to write concisely, but also just remember, do you actually want to put in five pieces of inf information or just two pieces of information to the job? Like you have to kind of pick and choose what's more important. Uh, so use less text. The second is do not state the obvious. I see this a lot in a lot of videos, like not just the BBC, like a lot of people do that, right? So you see people are submerged in water, you're seeing that, and then there's a text slate that says people were submerged, submerged in water or something. You don't need to do that because people are already seeing it. So even in the New York Times video, the bits that Dan was just showing of the building collapsing and stuff, I, I feel like we do that a lot where we, we show that, but there's text saying that buildings collapsed and I'm just like, I'm seeing it. <laughs> I don't want to read about it, right? So just don't use text to state the obvious. The third thing, don't cover your best shots. Again, talked about this a lot and really, really important to allow breathing space. So if you use a bit of text, don't immediately follow it with another bit of text. So even if you, again, like if you have to use three different sentences, to space it out in a way that people get that breathing space to even understand what you're saying and what your story is doing instead of having them read and read and read and then go into the story and then read and read and read. So um, I guess from all of this, the biggest takeaway should be that people are coming to watch your video, not to read your video. Digital video needs to be that that personal, intimate experience. The videos, your the favorite video you've ever seen, uh, is going to be something where you've got a connection, a human connection with with the, with the main character or the main the main contributor or even the presenter. It is, I think, it's really important to get that human, intimate experience. And a good way of avoiding using too much text, I think, is to get your interview right. I'm just going to talk about this really, really quickly. Um, I have seen a number of videos over the years where I've got hold of the rushes because I wanted to know what's gone wrong. And normally the problem is the interview has gone wrong. And as a result of that, the producers ended up using lots and lots and lots of text. I think a good interview equals less narrative text, which equals more intimacy. Now, Anyone who's done a course with me, and if you haven't done a course with me, please do come along and do some of my, my, my storytelling masterclass or my introduction to digital video. I talk about this thing called GIST quite a lot. Um, now, I use GIST a lot when we're well, all stages of making a video. I use GIST when I'm editing. I use GIST in my head when I'm filming. But most importantly, I use GIST when I'm planning an interview. GIST stands for Grab, Introduction, story, thought. It's a formula for video. All good videos need a good grab, something that grabs the audience's attention, something at the start of the film that's going to create such curiosity or interest that the audience is going to, to stick with you and watch on. The next thing the audience wants to know is who or what is this about? Okay. The next thing they want to know is the story. I, I can always break that down to what, where, when, why, how. Okay, though, honestly, those are the important things to answer. And finally, at the end of your video, you need a closing thought. What's the audience going to take away from this? Now, if you're thinking about this at your interview stage, I think it really, really helps. This, if you ask questions, thinking about what's, what can they say that's going to be the grab, that will make sure you get a really strong clip for the top of your interview. So, for instance, I might ask the question, describe how you felt when this thing happened to you. I always ask the question, tell us who you are and describe what you do. It's a really useful thing to have. You don't have to use it in your video. You might decide that, you know, an Aston does that job for you. But it's worth having that option, I think, in your edit. I always ask the questions, describe what, describe where, describe when, describe why, and... Uh, explain how. Uh, so for instance, describe what the problem is, describe where we are, and why the problem affects you here, uh, describe when this problem started, describe why it affects you, describe how you're trying to overcome it, describe how this thing makes you feel. And at the end, I always ask a closing thought question, e.g., what would your message be for people watching this? If you've planned your interview like this, 
you are going to get answers that you can use throughout your video. I absolutely promise you it does work. If you have a quick watch of this video, uh, it's one we made at BBC Africa. Uh, it's got all of those elements in it. It starts off with the intrigue, what's happening here. Then the character introduces herself, then she tells you what, where, when, why, how, pretty much. And then it finishes with a nice closing thought. All of that in one minute. Just formula really does work. My name is Alice. My name is Alice. 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 My name is Alice. My name is Alice. I am a midwife. I have delivered many thousands of babies. And thousands were named Alice after me. Alice. The girls are named Alice and the boys are named Alice. I knew that some of the babies were going to be named after me. But now that it gone wow, it makes me to feel happy. It makes me to feel that I'm part of them. My name is Alice. My name is Alice. I got a grandchild now. Alice gave birth to Alice, and Alice gave birth to another baby. If I'm not going to become a midwife, I don't know how I'm going to be. I'm so grateful to God that I have that opportunity. love the opening of this film i love the way they just create such curiosity you're watching it you're thinking okay i need to know what's going on here after that she introduces herself then she goes through what where when why how pretty much uh all the way through lovely shots lovely humor just a really great video and astonishingly all done in one minute um, i was told this really useful bit of advice when i was learning to become a video journalist tick off the answers you need not the questions you've asked and i think that's a really good thing to think about you know we all go in sometimes with a list of questions but if we're not getting the answers we need from them you haven't got what you need for your video so just literally listen through and if you need to ask the question again or in a slightly different way ask it again in a slightly different way because if they haven't said it you haven't got it on your card board so, so much for you guys to all take in. Now Board is going to amaze us with his huge technical skills. Welcome, Board. Sitting there Thank all you. quietly for the last half hour. Yeah, well, we've just been enjoying the uh, chat. This is this is good content, guys. Uh, learn a lot about video making, and it's all very, very good advice. Right. Um, so basically, um, I'm going to take you through uh, the video templates that we've got for text. Um, I'm just going to throw in like a massive caveat at the beginning here. Um, as you may well uh, have heard or not, uh, there's a big brand refresh going on. It's called Project Chameleon. And it basically means that um, most of these text templates are going to get a, a big redesign sometime next year when they can figure out exactly how they should look, um, et cetera. And um, we'll be looking to address um, some stuff that's been niggling people um, with these ones. So whatever thoughts you might have on the current templates um, and suggestions for improvements, um, particularly for you know whatever language you might be representing, um, please get in touch with me and I'll um i'm going to set up a spreadsheet basically and uh, gather some feedback uh, and it's a good opportunity to uh, improve on what we already have um in the meantime i'm just going to take you through what we do have at the moment remind you of some of the basic functionality and then show you how to um, perhaps push it a little bit further and i think that the big headline for what i'm going to be talking about is basically um making the most of the footage you have um, to make it look as slick and elegant as possibly uh, possible with, with the text templates that we have at our disposal. So <clears throat> without further ado, uh, further ado um, this is the title template. And I'm basically just going to go through some of the basic options that we've got in um, this template and in most of the other templates. They all mostly work the same. Um, when you put a template onto your timeline, it will go to a default position. It's usually middle. Um, 
you will have default positions and you can change them um, usually to a suggested upper or, or lower uh, position. Um, these are not locked in and I will talk a little bit more about that in a, just a few moments. Um, just want to take you through the extra stuff. So we added a few months back uh, something called the extra line spacing option. Um, it's for languages with um, uh, particularly Latin uh, languages with um, characters, uh, say uppercase characters with uh, accents on top of them. Um, like in my native language, Norwegian, we have a few of them. It makes them very tall. If you have a two line caption, um, with one of those uh, on the lower line, and they can clash uh, with some others. And uh, that's how we've kind of gotten around that. I can show you very, very quickly. Um, so basically, if I insert a J here, and then I put a line break in, and I write one of my Norwegian characters. Do you own a Tesla? Find you. Sorry? Do you own a Tesla, given your Norwegian? <laughs> well, my dad's got one, actually. Obviously. Conforming to stereotype. He also has dogs and lives in the woods and has a massive beard. I'm getting there. Um, if I tick the extra line spacing box here now, you'll see that it just moves up a few pixels. It just gives you a little bit more um, space and it uh, is going to be quite likely to um, prevent you basically from clashing too much on the lines with the text. Right, let's me rattle through a little bit uh, more here. So, um, build in, build out, that is pretty self explanatory. If you don't want animation on your text, usually we tend to keep it on. Um, you just show us really quickly, but I'm really sorry to just show us the difference for those who may not know. What's... Yeah. So basically, if you don't have animation on, if you untick build in and build out, mm -hmm. the text will basically be static across the entire template. It's not going to animate at all. But if you tick these boxes, then they will animate in and animate out. So you can turn off either, you can turn off both or you can keep all of it on. Uh, the same goes for this colored background, actually, which also comes in the template sets. It sits in the section called legibility. It's the top one here. We've picked a gray default color for it, so this will be really hard to find in a menu. That's mental note change in the next uh, set of templates. We can make it red, stands out a bit more. Um, but this one also has an animation, as you can possibly see from the background there. It animates from uh, black into gray. You turn that off, it's just static. And you can also pick different colors for it. Uh, not a huge amount of um, options, but uh, there are some. And you can also make it um, semi-transparent if you wish to do that. <clears throat> right, so that's kind of the basics of the template. Some templates have a bit more um, functionality. Um, I'll get to that a little bit later. Just want to mention also TV, say if you're doing a TV version, it will automatically conform to, um, to TV safe uh, areas, um, which also means I should mention this other thing, which is a fairly new thing in, in Final Cut. Uh, you can show custom overlays and these I believe are installed now with text templates. Um, you click on the view button and show custom overlay. It will basically show the TV safe area for BBC News. So just to explain what that actually means in real terms, who, who's that for? It means if, you're, if your piece is also going on TV, then this ensures that your text is readable to any screen that can that, that is currently um, displaying BBC News TV content. So some screens are not 16 by 9. So this area, I believe, is 14 by 9 text safe. So it just means that none of the text is cut off on any screens that are showing BBC World News Channel around the world. Okay, cool. 
Right, I'm just going to untick this again, and we're going to move on a little bit to some slightly more interesting stuff to look at other than a gray background. So um, I've just been looking at volcano shots because I'm a big fan of them. I think they look uh, amazing. Um, I'm sure you've all seen a story from uh, the Canary Islands. And um, I was just imagining in my head, how would I use this footage to best um, display text? So let's say this is the opening shot of a video. Looks like hell, and I've put a title on. Um, this would be the default position for it. Oh. Um, does that look good? Show of hands, hands up. Do you think this looks looks good? Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands at all. <laughs> Gagan says um, no. Nah, it is a bit messy. Um, also happens to be a big sort of blackish space just below it. Um, if I choose the lower position, oh, wrong title. Ah, oh, that's too low. So what can we do? Well, in this case, I just move it manually. And you just find the best spot in the frame for it where it interferes the less the least with um, what you want to show the audience, which is the amazing footage of everything being on fire and basically, well, you know, visual representation of hell. Um, that's about, yeah, 160 but This, this is okay people. to do that. What you know, I noticed when the, the templates first came out, there was a kind of instruction that we shouldn't break them too much, but this is fine to kind of, to move things around and to make them, to make the, the templates work as best they can with the shots. I was always of the persuasion of, if the default position is not giving you the best representation of the visuals, if it's actually getting in the way of what you want to show the viewer, then the much more elegant solution is to find the best space in the frame for it, um, basically. Because by definition, and I, I'm, I'm not going to slag off our templates and say they're ugly, but they're a lot less visually interesting than volcano crashing, uh, lava crashing into the sea. Um, hands, hands down, there's, there's no competition there, basically. So um, yeah, I, I say, play around a little bit with positioning to make your text the most impactful and elegant within the frame. Um, yeah, without going completely um, crazy with it, obviously. It needs to look good. Um, and if the default position doesn't offer you that, then yeah, play around a little bit with it. Um, I've done the same here with the uh, title split templates. There's just about enough space in there. Again, it just looks better than um, the default position. Simple as that. Yeah. Um, and you know, you should always start with your strongest footage. This is the strongest footage that was available in this story. So that's where I have started. Right, um, I'm gonna crack on a little bit. So we have time for questions off the back. Um, let's go to um, a combined credit and narrative here. Um, for the next one, just because it sits quite nicely together with this one. And just wanted to really point out that in the credit template, we have a lot of different options for um, showing where you've got the material from. We've got pretty much all the major social platforms represented here now. And we're also looking at adding um, a map pin like you have in Google Maps, this just to show ge uh, geographic location and the generic sort of camera looking little uh, logo as well. Um, if it's just, you know, footage that you've got that hasn't come off a social platform, although that tends to happen more rarely these days. Um, now, gradient and uh, narrative text is um, a quite interesting one that deserves a bit of uh, space for itself, I think. So here we've got a shot that is, um, it's, a bit, it's, it's a good mix of bright and dark. Um, I've put a gradient at the bottom here. 
So you can see how bright it actually was before I did. And the reason why I've done that is because I want to put some narrative text on at some point, and it's here. Now, again, if I had just used the default position for this narrative text, it would have sat right there. So again, I've moved it down ever so slightly, about 75 pixels. And I think that's a good position for the text. It's not interfering with what we actually want to see. Um, and if you look a little bit closer as well, um, I waited to put the text on. So you let the shot breathe for a little bit. And actually it's a bit of a, it was a bit of a necessity as well because the, the, the guy who shot it um, basically had a, he, he was a bit impatient with his, uh, with his uh, zooming. So he didn't stay on many of the shots for a very long time. So here he's just gone, okay, I'm just gonna zoom in straight away almost. And that's actually quite nice because it makes the shot a bit more interesting. Feels like you're getting closer to something. So let that zoom happen first, then put the narrative text on when the shot is resting. And then again, he zooms back in and I've taken the gradient off as the zoom is happening to make it less obvious that it's happening. Um, the reason why I've done that is I absolutely cannot stand it when gradients come off and on um, with narrative text or in the middle of a shot. I think if you're using a gradient, it needs to be happening as if the gradient was never there. The audience should never know that you had to put a gradient on the shot. Um, it just looks inelegant, I think, when it's uh, animating on and off. So for instance, so basically this is the same thing. With the gradient across the entire shot, I haven't kept in the, the final bit where it's zooming in because if you're pressed for time um, with your video, if you don't have, if someone tells you you need to make the video shorter, you need to lose a few seconds, then this is how I would treat that shot without the final zoom in. Now, if you see the shot with just the gradient animating with the text, it's a slightly different or quite different experience, I would say. Um, it looks like this. To me, that's a lot less elegant than uh, just keeping the gradient on for the entirety of the shots and crucially turning off build in and build out at the beginning and at the end of the shots. If uh, you keep it on, then it will again just be very apparent what's happening. And it's just not, it's not as nice and elegant as it could have been. I'm so glad you're talking about this board because this is one of my pet hates. I hate it when you can see the gradient building on and off in a shot. The gradient's there to make your text stand out, right? Um, but as board says totally and utterly correctly, you're not meant to notice it as the viewer either. Um, it's doing a job for you, it's working for you, but we've just got to hide the fact we're using it from the viewer. So just edit it on and off on shot changes. It's, it's something I'm really uh, insistent upon. Yeah. Um, right. Next one up is um, subtitling and name Astons. And <clears throat> name Astons is something that I'm really looking to improve in the next um, big update to the templates. I think there are a number of problems with the current um, Astons. Uh, we should definitely offer more than one line, both for name and for uh, designation. So I'll be showing a little work around on that. Um, main reason why is because the lines go very long at the moment and they tend to uh, cut across people's bodies or faces or uh, all sorts of things. It doesn't look very elegant. So I've got a little hack for that one, um, which looks good. 
um, and it's not too complicated to make. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, making subtitles look elegant, but also easy to read uh, for people. So again, I'm just going to show um, a piece of camera here uh, by a geologist talking about this lava um, and how instinctively you might just use the templates um, to subtitle an Aston. So, You can see, so this is a pretty untraditional piece of camera, I guess, because she's really just gone, okay, I want to show you as much as possible of what's going on here. So she's almost out of shots. Um, now, the very default position for this name, Aston, is actually just right on her helmet. So if I just move it up, that works, because that's actually the only space in this shot that is you know, visually uninteresting. Um, and I don't need to do anything more to it, actually. It's just there. It's clear of the BBC logo, and it's kind of doing the job. Um, one thing you could do if you wanted to um, make it a bit easier to read is to concentrate the text in a smaller area. Um, and that's basically what I've done with this. So this is my name Aston Hack, um, where you basically, instead of adding one template with all the information, you add two name templates and you toggle the settings a little bit um, and move one of them down. So I'll, I'll take you through it. Um, in the top one, you can see we have the entire title the designation in one template. Basically, what I've done with hit these ones is I've taken out the last few words of the designation and I've added them to a single template where I've kept the name empty. Then in the template with the name and the beginning of the designation, I have unticked the bar and then finally, I have moved the second template down 60 pixels. So this is what they look like when I put them on all together. We put minus 60 in the y-axis. Minus is not working for me for some reason, so I'm just going to do it manually. And that looks about right. comes on nicely together. This is good if you've got almost any traditional interview shot as well, where you have your interviewee in the middle of the screen. It's a lot less likely to interfere with um, you know, their face or their chest or neck or anything else that might just look a bit odd. Now, um, another thing about this shot is the interview is quite uh, low in the screen and, you know, Say you get some agency uh, material in, or say you're just transcribing the interview that you have done. Um, it's tempting to just fill up the entire uh, subtitle template, so it'll save you a tiny bit of time. Um, if you think about how it will look and how easy it is to read the subtitle and take in the well, quite amazing footage at the same time, or any footage, um, then it might be worth thinking about how much you put into each template. So I've done an alternative set of temp, um, subtitling for this section where I've just broken up that sentence you just saw into two different templates, getting everything centered and onto one line. And what that does now is it doesn't interfere as much with her face. It's easier to follow. because it's following the pace at which she is speaking. Let me just turn her up a little bit as well.
Um, and that just makes it a much more easier experience to, to follow for the viewer. They're much more easily um, taking in the information that's being conveyed. And, you know, a lot of the time we are conveying fairly complex information uh, as the nature of news. So it's all about helping the viewer to take in as much as possible. Um, and on that point as well, I just want to mention um, this little guy who doesn't always get a lot of attention. Um, it's called the highlighter. It's a fairly versatile template and it's a good one to use if you really want to bring attention to something that's being said, a key de detail. So here she's talking about lava flowing down the hillside um, and then mentioning the name of some of the stuff that we're seeing. And in order to kind of increase the visual variation as well, I've just zoomed in on the shot and brought in the highlight templates. And forgotten to turn off the noise, the audio. <laughs> So you can see the balls coming down the hill and just increase the size of the text there as a little bit as well, just to signal that this is a key part of what's being said. It's really interesting because, for instance, AJ Plus, I don't know if you've ever seen the text that they use, but the key words when they're using narrative text, they always put a kind of a, a highlighter around just to kind of really bring out that this is something really important. So the highlighter tool that you've just shown there is, is a good way of doing that using our templates. Yeah, yeah. Can um, you just show us where it is in the installed titles? Because yeah, I, I missed it for a while, I must admit. Just show us where it is. Where, where does it live? It's hiding in the basement. You have to scroll all the way down because it's in a category called X explainer tools, um, which we're hoping to populate a little bit more in the future as well. So it's kind of hiding below branding and uh, pillar box and legibility, um, where actually it probably just should be sitting up in the top section with all the uh, editorial and info. It should be sitting in editorial really. Um, so that's another thing that we're going to look at when we're redesigning um, the template set for the next generation templates. Um, and that kind of leaves me, um, having gone through most of them, unless someone is really keen on me talking about quote and social quotes, which they're not heavily used templates and they're pretty obvious, um, I think. Um, I can show quickly social quotes just, I know it's not in use a um, great deal. I think what we want to do with it in the future is add uh, the uh, ability to add uh, images to it. So avatars, or if you have a tweet pick or, or you know, a, a little you know, frame for like a uh, video that's come off social as well. I think it needs, uh, needs a bit of a design lift, um, but you do have some nifty, um, options in here already, like you can highlight text. So I highlighted a word, for instance, um, and that's just done using these controls down the bottom here. So you can just move that around a little bit to decide which bits of text you would like to hi highlight. Um, and you can also make the background um, slightly transparent if you like, as well as change the color of text and all the other options that I um, told you about before. Uh, and you also now have the full list of um, social network logos, uh, which will actually change uh, the color of the background as well to uh, signify which social media network you've taken the except from, but we recognize it does need a little bit more work. So that bit is coming. One final point on subtitles is, um, you know, there, there's more and more of a push for um, closed caption files to be included with our videos, both on sites um, and on YouTube as well. And if you are doing that, um, I think the point about making um, your subtitles or, or your captions fit with what's on screen um, becomes even more apparent and, and 
um, a, a bigger need for it. This is something I took from the BBC uh, website the other day. Someone had been subtitling a video. You can see the captions, they're sitting fairly high on the screen and <clears throat> covering up her mouth. That's not, that's not a great viewer experience. Um, this is what it would look like if this had been a single line caption. And you can see it's a big improvement um, so it's just about splitting up that text a tiny bit more to just make it a nicer viewing experience, but also nicer for the contributors because um, they're going to be seeing this as well. And that's you know important to keep in mind. I think a really important thing to remember is as well, if you're doing subtitles, just make sure they're easy for the audience to follow. And that kind of means breaking them at, at sensible moments. So for instance, if you hit the end of a sentence, that's a great time to end that subtitle and then you can move on to a next subtitle or if the contributor hits a natural pause if they're thinking that's the moment to change the subtitle so basically you, you try and keep the subtitles as short as possible um but kind of hitting natural breaks it, there's, there's definitely an art form to it i was going to do a little demonstration but we've massively overrun um but just always, when, when you are doing your subtitling, just think about, is this easy for the audience to follow? Well, can we just really quickly demonstrate the, uh, the subtitle blink, which is a mistake that we see all the time. Um, yeah. So basically, hmm. subtitle blink just means that whoever's been subtitling has left a tiny gap in between. And you're talking like just a couple of frames. It just makes it look like this. Oh God, I see that all the time. It drives me crazy. Yeah, and there's no, there's no need for it, especially when Final Cut has this wonderful snapping tool, which sits over here, which means that your components become magnetic to each other. So it makes it really easy to just put stuff right up against each other so you get that nice flowing one it works if you want to time different layers as well it you just makes everything, everything building static. on and off at the same point that really really helps sorry if you can get things uh, building on and off at the same point so if you've got your gradient and a subtitle you've got your gradient and a piece of narrative text just check that they they do all, all come on and off at the same time yeah um, and one other thing that I just want to mention about subtitles as well, which I see uh, quite a lot, especially if you have um, a subtitle with lots of text in it, or sort of medium amount of text, is that you very often, too often, get what's called an orphan in the typography industry. Um, a caption well, so a widow, funnily enough, right? widow or orphan. Um, yes, um, you know, we'd, we'd rather not see, um, either. Can you just explain what, what bit we're looking at here? Yeah, bit? it's basically a single word on the bottom line. You have, you know, not a perfectly formed sentence, or it could even be a perfectly formed sentence, and you could actually have a single word with a full stop on the bottom line. And the way to get around it is find a logical um, breaking point in the sentence. So now we see falls of lava were formed. Line shift and huge blocks. That's not perfect either, but it looks a lot better. Three words are better than one. Um, I always try to find a good balance between the top and bottom. Even if it means that the top line is slightly shorter than the bottom, it just means that it's balanced and it's easy for the eye to take in and it visually, aesthetically looks correct. If you I look at a book, it's very rare that you get one word on a line because desktop publishers are taught not to have single words. Widows or orphans are exactly what they're called. Brilliant.
Um, thank you so much, Bo. That's a brilliant demonstration. Can I just grab screen share back from you? Any question? Oh, sorry. Before we go, Bo, one question from uh, Ronnie in Dakar saying regarding branding, sometimes the opening board eats up the best shots. Can we be flexible about it, like starting it a little bit late? Marketing uh, are quite adamant that the first thing you should see in a BBC video is the opening swirl. So I would probably say uh, try to plan your uh, shoot for it so that you have something striking to show in the first two seconds uh, before you need to put in any other uh, contextual text. Basically, I think that's, that's the best way around that bit. Um, the opening swirl should always be in the first two seconds of the video is to do with brand attribution. Um, and that is a big, big sacred uh, word. So I'm afraid uh, not is the um, answer to that. Sorry for the bad news there. Um, Gagan asks, please can you show us how to change colors in subtitles when we're transcribing interviewee start? Sorry, I should have done. Yes, I didn't see it. Sorry, I just printed ah. it. Yeah, 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 screen of again? Course. yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and that's as simple as um, you click on the subtitle menu in question, and you have the usual option. Um, here, by the way, build in and build out is off by default because the animation just makes it a bit like the text link um, effect. So, unless you have a strong case to to use build in and build out, we have it off. Um, Here's where you choose the different uh, colors for the speakers. And if you have more than four speakers in your video, um, I pity you because uh, it can become quite complicated when you're uh, editing. But the general rule of thumb is you use up your colors for the first four. And if you have to go back for a fifth, then you just go back to um, alternate with the first one. So. And if you're doing voiceover subtitles, so for your reporter, try always to get them as speaker one. That's yeah. the general BBC rule. Yeah. Reporter, should, you should always strive to get reporter to be uh, white, basically, uh, text, not skin colour. Um, I'm not going to bore you with any more subtitle talk at all. I'm just going to point out one really important thing, though. Um, I only discovered this last night when I was doing my research. There is a difference between uh, closed captions and subtitles. Subtitles are where you're just transcribing people's uh, speech. Closed captions are a little bit more in depth. So for instance, for people who really need subtitles on, people with kind of hearing impediments, whatever, closed captions are just providing a little bit more detail. And I think this is a really useful thing for digital video generally. So I have always by default subtitled important sounds. If there was like, you know, the sound of a, you know, if I had a cat and the, the cat was meowing behind me, I would not subtitle that. But if there were police sirens and you couldn't see the police car, for instance, and this was a story about kind of, you know, police activity, I would absolutely do square brackets, um, police sirens. It's just telling people who aren't listening or who aren't able to listen that there is an important sound. And I think it's a really useful thing to do. If you started your video with square brackets, you know, police sirens, it's telling people as well who are watching without sound that sound is important to this video and you're going to switch the sound on and as soon as people switch the sound on all the evidence says they engage for longer with your video sound is really immersive it's a really really important thing to do if you can get people listening to your videos um, they will stick with it for a whole lot longer because it makes them feel that they're in the story um do we have any more questions anyone Lovely seeing you all. Take care. Thanks for coming. Okay.